So let's first discuss frequent pattern mining in data streams. We know in current big data era, besides we get a huge amount of data stored in database systems, in fire system, on the web, but also we have Internet of Things or Internet of Sensors. So in those kind of scenarios, there are lots of stream data. The stream data, the feature usually is they come in and go continuously. They are ordered in the sequence, but they are changing dynamically. They come in and go very fast, but in very huge volume. Okay. This is very different from traditional uh, finite persistent data sets stored in the fire systems, in database management system, or on the web. So now let's look at the major characteristics of data streams. First, data streams usually represent huge volumes of continuous data. They could be potentially infinite, like uh, the online sensors. They have no ending at this point. So they, they are fast changing. They may also require fast real-time response, like uh, anomalies or emergency handling. Okay. Then for data stream, usually it captures nicely of our data processing needs of today, because even in database systems, the data could be so huge, you may only want to scan them in a sequential manner like data streams or you don't want to keep repeating getting them back again. Okay. So to that extent, the, even in the large data stored, you may also process them in the data stream manner, not to say you really have to enter large amount of sensor data. So uh, in general, we say for processing data streams, random access is expensive because of the data come and go, you don't want to fetch back or you cannot fetch forward as well. So usually we call these algorithms developing data streams called single scan algorithm. That means for any particular data set, particular page, you can only have one look. So uh, another interesting thing is the data stream in many cases, you may like to store some kind of sketch, store a summary of the data seen so far instead of storing the detailed data because you don't have such volume or such processing power. Then another important challenge is most data streams actually are coming at the very low level, like uh, the particular sensors, and they also come in multi-dimensional feature, for example, even for the data, they may come, some part could be the temperature, some part could be video, some part could be audio, some could be the text data. Okay. So it's multidimensional in nature. But for the information processing needs, usually you want to summarize or process the data and pattern at a multi-level and in multi-dimensional way. So we can see there are lots of research challenges on data stream processing. If we look at the architecture of the uh, data stream processing system, usually we call this a stream data management system. What we have is we have a stream query processor. You get a multiple data streams streaming into this processor at the same time in a continuous way. But even for user or application programs, they usually post continuous query rather than ad hoc queries. It's like a watchdogs. They won't see anything abnormal. They want to summarize the data in a multidimensional space. And then for the, this stream query processor, usually you have some scratch space. There could be a big main memory or even plus some disks. These multiple streams coming down here will be summarized, processed, uh, especially answer your continuous query, the results will be streaming back to the user's application programs. So this is a typical way to process streaming data online in the real time. Okay. The problem becomes for frequent pattern mining. How can we find the frequent patterns in this data streams? Actually, it's pretty challenging. Then we look at the, the major differences between stream mining versus stream query. Okay. 
The first thing is stream mining and stream querying, they share many common difficulties. For example, you can only do single scan, you need fast response, you have to handle dynamic noisy data. But for stream mining, usually you want to see the global picture, you want to see patterns, you want to find the clusters. It often requires less precision than the stream querying because stream querying want to pinpoint to a particular point. You may need to perform join, grouping, sorting, which actually in streams uh, join and sorting those algorithms actually is pretty difficult because you cannot uh, see the past data, you cannot you know, predict the future incoming data as well. Uh, but patterns are hidden. They are more general than querying, so their processing is different. Actually, for stream data mining, there are lots of research and development activities already. Okay. Uh, one branch actually study pattern mining data streams. Another is doing the multi-dimensional, multi-level online summary uh, of data streams. And also, uh, data stream can be clustered dynamically, can do dynamic classification, can find outliers and anomalies. So there are lots of research in data mining all these frontiers. So what we are studying in this lecture, we will only touch pattern mining in data streams. So one important thing is for mining frequent patterns, in stream data, it is unrealistic to try to find a precise frequent patterns. Simply says the past precise thing may already been gone. It's pretty hard to capture them. The future one may not be coming yet, so it's pretty hard to predict them. And even for the one you can hold, just because they are so big, you cannot store them even in a compressed form like FP3. So what we expect is trying to find approximate answers. Okay. But in many cases, approximate answer may be sufficient for our analysis purpose. For example, you may find a router could be interested in finding the flows. Uh, those flow in the network, you may find whose frequency is at least 1% of the entire traffic stream seen so far. If you identify those patterns, those frequent occurring flows, you'll probably be pretty happy. On the other hand, you may say, if you, uh, for this sigma, if you give me the count, it's probably a little less like uh, over 1 over 10, or you would say the error rate is 0.1%, you probably feel it's very comfortable, you think you're, you're doing good thing already. Okay. In that case, we may develop some very efficient algorithm to mine such patterns with good approximation like this. Okay. Then in this lecture, I'm going to only introduce one algorithm on this, which is called lossy counting algorithm, developed by Manku and Monwani in 2002. Okay. The major idea is not to keep all the items especially not to keep the items with very low support count. That means if they are very low, they unlikely will reach the frequency threshold. You do not even keep them. Okay. The advantage is you can guarantee some error bound. That means I actually find all the frequent items. Okay. Uh, but of, of course, you need still to keep really large set of traces. Your buffer size should be rather big. Let's look at lossy counting algorithm, but we only introduce frequent single items. Okay, they did study multiple item sets. For the simple explanation of the idea, we first look at the frequent single item counting. Okay. Suppose you get a very, very huge you know, data streams. You may de divide the stream into buckets, but the bucket size could be 1 over epsilon, because your epsilon is 0.1% error bound. Then the bucket size could be 1 over epsilon means 1 over 0.1% is 1,000. Means each bucket should have 1,000 items. Okay. Then this 1,000 item, we assume that the main memory 
size is big enough, you can easily hold this one bucket. Then, at the very beginning, when the first bucket comes, the, the main memory at the very beginning you can assume for this part is empty. Okay, the summary is empty. But then you come, you get the first bucket, you get 1,000 items. Okay. Then you start counting them. For example, you may count uh, there are four red ones, uh, there are two uh, yellow ones, there's one green one, one blue one, uh, black, and so on. Okay. So at the end of this bucket boundary, we will decrease all the counters by one. You probably can see, there are many if they only appear once, like uh, the green one, the blue one, the black one, they all gone, because uh, once you decrease the counter by one, the counter is zero, they all gone. Even for red ones, you get four, now you become, you get the counter becomes three, uh, you get two yellow ones, the counter actually is only one, okay. So that means you actually count, you finer your counter, actually get a less than the real one. Okay. When the next bucket of the stream coming, okay, you probably see you actually empty a lot of space because the counter was not existing. There are too, there are too few items in this color. Okay. Then you may get additional red ones and yellow ones or, or even black ones. Okay. So you can see at the end of this bucket, okay. then you will do the same. You decrease all the counters by one. So those not frequent, they, they are gone again. So the, the yellow one, you can see originally you get one, you get one more, but you decrease by one, you still keep one. The black one is one, the red one you get a little more because you, the red one is so frequent. After, you know, you, you're see, thinking bucket by bucket, you get many, many buckets, you, you, you still keep this counter, you know, 1,000 counters. Okay, and, uh, because you get 1,000 buckets, at most you have 1,000 counters, you only get a number, so the space actually is quite limited. Okay. Then, if finally we want to output the frequent patterns, the, f the interesting thing is whether we will be able to output all the frequent patterns if they are frequent in the data streams, but maybe we have some reduced count. Okay. So actually, uh, suppose the support threshold is sigma, the error threshold is epsilon, and the stream length is n so far. Okay. Then the output are those items with frequency count exceeding sigma minus epsilon times n. Simply says, if for any item you finally found its counter with this number or bigger, you will output as a frequent item. So the key is because at the end of each bucket, we decrease the counter by one. Okay. So we, we will undercount something. So the question becomes, how much do we undercount? Okay. So if the stream length seen so far is n, the bucket size is one over epsilon, we can easily you know, determine the frequency counter error should be no more than number of buckets. Why? Because for each item, for every bucket, you decrease the count by one. Okay. If some item come even later, at the very beginning, they did not come, you did not de decrease them. So to that extent, you decrease less than number of buckets. So if they come even at the very beginning, the first bucket, they, they stay all along the way, you will decrease the count by number of buckets. But how, what is the number of buckets? You pretty see, because you have seen n elements, okay? And the bucket size is one over epsilon, so n elements over bucket size is number of buckets, which is n over one over epsilon. So you get the epsilon times n. That means the, the frequency count error at most is epsilon times n. And we know epsilon is pretty small, so the error count error is not that big. Okay. Then we look at the lossy counting. They have some interesting uh, 
property we call approximation guarantee. The first thing is there's no false negatives. Simply says if the item is frequent, it will be captured and output. Why? If we can see is if your item is frequent, that means your total support threshold should be sigma times n or more. Okay. Then, because we output a frequent item exceeding sigma minus epsilon times n, we know we already under count, count this part at most. That means, actually, since you output all these, you will output every item whose support count is no less than sig sigma times n. So there's no false ne negatives. Okay. But there could be false positives. Where the false positive comes? Just because probably sometimes they come later, uh, like you may have one color, okay, suppose orange, they come at a very late stage. Okay. So they actually, the previous uh, decrement by one actually did not touch them. So now they really have this, suppose their support is sigma minus epsilon times n. You, you actually output this, say this one could be a frequent item. Okay. But this orange one, uh, actually you, the real support is, is this. Okay. They do not suffer the decrement, so, or only suffer one. So then your support count, uh, this one actually in principle is not frequent in real, but you think they are frequently just output as a, as a frequent item. Okay. So the false positive has this true frequency, at least of this. So that means uh, that the orange one have the true frequency of this one. You still count them as a frequent item. So you do have some false positive. But frequency count underestimated by at most epsilon times n because we already have this. So you have some nice guarantee for, you know, finally you have just this bucket size as your main memory. You actually can return, you know, all the frequent items and it may contain some false positive, may have some underestimate of your frequent count, frequency count. But still, it is a nice elegant algorithm with very limited resource you can handle data streams. Of course, after this, there are lots of studies uh, by improving, for example, improving lossy counting algorithm. One interesting study is by Metawali uh, in 2005. They do space saving computation of frequent and top K elements. The general philosophy is they may try to use more memory space. If you really have bigger memory, you don't have to restrict it down to one over epsilon as your bucket size. But we are not going to discuss this in more detail. Uh, another interesting thing is in this lecture, we only discuss frequent one item sets. That means frequent single item, we discuss how to mine the approximate one. Actually, in Manku and Monwani paper, they also discussed frequent K item sets, how to maintain counter, how to do, you know, lossy counting. But uh, due to limited time, we will not introduce this algorithm. You may like to read the paper by, you know, itself. Then uh, there are also some subsequent studies on how to mine sequential patterns in data streams. It is a pretty challenging task as well. Okay. So I'm going to only introduce you two papers. One is Manku and Madhwani's paper. Another is Madhwani's paper. Uh, you may want to see you know, in how to mine uh, streams in patterns in streams in a very interesting way. Thank you.